everybody in now, admitted. Everybody hear me okay? Great, thanks. Well, good morning and welcome everybody to this uh, short uh, webinar on Cyber Essentials. Can't believe it's day five of what has been a, a really fast moving, action packed Cyber Scotland week with lots of events taking place. And I'm, uh, I'm sure that you'll agree that it's uh, showcased the great work that's taking place in Scotland and beyond. And hopefully you'll get a lot out of this webinar as well and find it uh, hugely interesting. Uh, just by way of introduction, um, I'm Graham Bay, and I'm currently a cybersecurity coordinator aligned to the Scottish Business Resilience Centre in Linlithgow. And for the last couple of years now, I've been working closely with Scottish Government, Police Scotland, uh, National Cyber Security Centre in London and others um, to raise awareness and um, of cyber security and promote cyber security to businesses and organisations across um, all areas, all sectors in Scotland, but with a real focus on the private sector and SMEs, because as, as you know, that's the bulk of um, the business in Scotland. And thereafter, um, I've been promoting um, resources that are available to SMEs to help them um, develop and become more cyber secure through all the resources that are available to them and essentially help them flourish in what is an ever changing digital world and fast moving digital world. But as the reliance on the internet increases, so too does the threat of internet and cyber related crime. And more and more of our devices are uh, being interconnected through the Internet of Things. And, and we had a, a session earlier on this week um, with IASME looking at how to make connected devices secure. And that, that was really interesting because um, cyber criminals throughout the world are, are, are sort of looking to take advantage and exploit vulnerabilities within the organisations because of that interconnectivity. And the NCSC advises that the vast majority of these um, internet-borne attacks are um, not targeted, they're opportunistic, and they can easily be prevented by putting some basic cyber security uh, measures in, in place. So um, this afternoon, this morning, we're going to talk about uh, cyber essentials and the certification scheme and how that can help you protect against the vast majority of these internet borne attacks. And, and last year, uh, IASME were appointed as the, the single um, industry partner with the NCSC for the operational delivery of cyber essentials uh, across the UK. And um, I'm delighted this morning that we're joined by Neil Firminger from IASME, who is the uh, the technical lead for Cyber Essential Certification Scheme for IASME. He has a, a wealth of experience in Cyber Essentials and also uh, sits on the, the NCSC and IASME Joint Technical Working Group looking at uh, developing Cyber Essentials moving forward. And you're going to hear from Neil today talk about some of the, the changes and some of the controls that uh, are in place around about that. Um, also joining us today in the panel is Keith McDevitt. Uh, Keith is a Cyber Resilience Integrator at uh, the Scottish Government in the Cyber Resilience Unit. And Keith, uh, for a number of years now, has been at the forefront of implementing strategy and policy around about Scottish Government cyber. And the first cyber resilience strategy in Scotland, action plans that flew from that, uh, and also the, the recently launched uh, Cyber Resilience Scotland strategic framework, and there'll be action plans coming from that. So we're really looking forward to uh, Keith's perspective around about cyber essentials. Uh, also joining us is uh, Carrie Hendricks. Uh, Carrie will be familiar to a few of you. I think he's been involved in about uh, an event every, every day this week, Carrie. Uh, Carrie's got a wealth of experience as a, a technical uh, investigator. Um, he's an advisor, he's a trainer, he's God, he's the Global Operations Director for ID Cyber Solutions, who themselves are a licensed uh, IASME uh, certifying body. Uh, and Carrie's got a lot of knowledge technical, practical knowledge on assessing against the standards required for uh, cyber essentials. So looking forward to hearing from Carrie as well. And making up the panel, we've got Harry, Harry McLaren, 
Uh, Harry is the product uh, lead for Adharma uh, in relation to detection and response. Um, and Harry also has a, a wealth of experience, not only in IT, but in cybersecurity as well. Of course, he's the, the co-founder of Cyber Scotland Connect, a uh, community-based membership organization that exists focused in Scotland to, um, to run events and, and generally support um, businesses and people who are in that cy cybersecurity space. So welcome everybody. We've got a great lineup uh, this morning. Um, really looking forward to the session. As we go through the webinar, if you've got any questions, just pop them up on the question and answer uh, button and we'll do our utmost to, uh, to answer them. This webinar has also been recorded, so it'll be available online afterwards as well. So that said, I'm going to hand you over to Neil now, who's going to talk about Cyber Essentials. Thanks, Neil. Good morning, everybody. Um, right, I'm just going to give you a brief 15 minute overview of Cyber Essentials. And then afterwards, we'll open up a discussion about what I've presented to you and get the views of the panel. Uh, and let's go. Right, let's. OK, so uh, Cyber Central has been around since 2014. And I, as me, was there at the beginning. Um, a couple of members of I were invited to have discussions with the NCSC about providing a accreditation um, for businesses, a basic cyber cyber security accreditation way back the, all those years ago. And uh, so we've been there from the beginning. We were one of the original two accreditation bodies uh, offering the scheme. Uh, and towards the over the, the next five, five, six years, there were five accreditation bodies up until April 2020. Um, uh, the a tender was put out in 2019 for the NCSC to have a sole partner to run the scheme because they wanted a consistent approach to the scheme because with five accreditation bodies, there was five interpretations. And in the July of 2019, IASME was awarded sole partner status for the NCSC to run the scheme from April 2020. And since then, we have been the only people offering Cyber Essential Certification through our series of certifying bodies of who we've got one on the panel today. So Cyber Essentials is made up of five technical controls. So they're here, and they're firewalls, secure configuration, user access controls, malware protection, and patch management. So I'm gonna just go through these very quickly of what this means and what they cover, okay? So the first one is about, yeah, your firewalls or your boundary to the internet. Because Cyber Essentials is about protecting you from internet commodity attacks. So it's interested in devices that are connected to the internet. Okay. So it applies, the firewall controls applies to all your boundary firewalls. So this is your physical firewalls, you know. So a, a box you have somewhere that's connected to your internet that's in your office or it could be the software firewall on your desktop, your laptop, or your servers, okay? And it's to ensure that only safe and necessary network services being accessed from the internet. Now, there's a series of controls under which you need to uh, apply for firewalls, simple things like changing the default password on the firewall device or blocking all incoming ports. But that's just a basic overview of firewalls, and we can go into different aspects if required. But so I've got to do all, all five controls. So I could talk for hours on each control, to be honest. <laughs> right, so the next control is secure configuration, and this applies to any internet-facing server, desktop, computer, laptop, your tablets, your mobile phones, and your files and routers. And this is making sure that you have services and applications you don't use are removed from your devices or switched off so they're not causing extra vulnerabilities to your machines uh, and also it is about 
setting up secure policies to access your devices. This is where your password policies come in and the requirements about passwords are in the scheme. Okay, so the next one is related to the last one and it, it crosses over a little bit. This is about user access control. And this applies to all your server desktops, all, all your end user devices. And it's about making sure user accounts are only assigned to the correct individuals or authorized individuals. And also that the principle of account separation is in place. So that means using a, for your daily work, using a single user account to do that. But that account doesn't have administration privileges. So when you're with your daily work, we mean right, typing Word documents, Excel spreadsheets, accessing your email. But when it comes to wanting to install software or something like that, you're prompted or asked to use an administrator account that allows you to do that. This helps a great deal in protecting you from ransomware, where often they are preying on that you have administrator administrative privileges on your account and can run software in the background without your knowledge so it's a simple process and it, it you know it's very effective in what cyber essentials is trying to protect against malware protection is the the fourth control in place here and again applies to all your desktop computers laptops tablets mobile phones right this is to restrict uh, known malware, etc., running on your computers or blocking it or blocking files, etc., from running, and also to uh, block incorrect or bad websites, illegitimate websites, etc., from running. So there's a series of controls here, and this one's actually split in three because mobile phones, it's difficult to get an anti-malware product to run on there. It's probably not a real known one for iPhones, et cetera. So we're talking about choosing the right apps from the application store and having a approve and deny list for the applications that are used on your mobile devices as well. That's a form of malware protection because those need to be trusted applications. So when it comes to the desktops and laptops, it's your traditional what was an, called antivirus software, but it's more called internet security software or anti-malware software. Now you need to have one of those in place and configured to a set series of controls. Okay, so the last one, it's been called patch management. It's recently been upgraded to have a new name of security update management and applies to all servers, desktop computers, your laptops, tablets, mobile phones, your firewalls and routers. And this means that you need to apply all high and critical updates within 14 days of release by the, by the vendor. Now, this is getting increasingly harder because a lot of the vendors are changing their update processes, the amount of information that is being published, but it's key that all your um, software and your operating systems are still supported by the vendors and they are supplied with security updates. I'll come on to it in a little bit more detail because there's a slight change in the requirements coming up in, in the next couple of three months, okay? Okay, one area that's not talked about a lot, but is very critical to this, is the scoping of a cyber essential assessment. So this is setting the boundary of the certification. We have many companies who um, run older software or maybe only require certain networks to get certified. So there needs to be some boundaries, and it is often defined currently by uh, your boundary to the internet, et cetera, and the use of firewalls or routers to create that boundary. But what I need to make clear here is that for to be compliant with Cyber Essentials, all your devices and operating systems must be supported by the vendor. And one of the key things here, as I've just mentioned about the security update management, the vendors are changing their support cycles. In the last couple of three years, Microsoft have made big changes to the way 
Windows 10 versions are supported and very much reduce the length of time those versions are being supported. So we've had to ask for more information now than has been previously asked for in the past, maybe by a previous accreditation body, even by IASME. We have to ask for more information to make sure that the operating systems in use for the scope are definitely support, in, still in support by the vendors. Okay, there is no allowance for unsupported devices or operating systems within the scheme. What would need to happen here is if you are still using unsupported devices or uh, yeah, uh, operating sy systems, they need to be removed from the scope of the scheme. And this needs to be carried out by a process called network segregation. So this needs to be done by firewall or VLAN effectively creating a second network where they sit on those devices and all those operating systems sit on a different network to the network that has in support operating systems or devices. Okay, this is something that is a complex process and can be complicated within CE and this is where I would certainly go to one of our certifying bodies for assistance or you can come to IASME directly and we, we can provide advice on this area. Okay, so uh, Cyber Essentials has been, hasn't had a major update for a long time. It hasn't been gone under any serious review for nearly six or seven years. And one of the things that needed to happen when we became, the, I asked me, became the sole partner, the NCSC required that we need to carry out a major review of whether Cyber Essentials is still effective, whether the controls in there are still current, and what changes would be need to be made to the scheme. Now, that process has been going on as part of the NCSC, I asked me, CE Technical Working Group. Uh, and we have been meeting regularly uh, on and off, and it probably is once a week, actually, on average, since last May to discuss changes, et cetera, and what we can be, can be added or taken away from the scheme. So coming up in Q2 this year, there will be some clarifications, I would say, of the scheme. Uh, they've probably been required for some time, and I think both sides, that's the NCSC and ourselves, would agree they've been required. Um, we were hoping to make larger changes, but some of those are proving more technically challenging and evolutions of thinking around some cybersecurity processes. It's going to take a little longer before we can make those changes. So there's going to be a new Cyber Essentials infrastructure uh, requirements for IT infrastructure document, bit of a mouthful there, but it's available on the NCSE website. But there will be a new version of this released with some clarifications in it coming up, as I say, probably in April. And that's the, that's the time scale we're working to, but we've just had a few things we need to get more clarification on this week. But there will be clarification on the use of BYOD, also referred to in the document as end user, uh, uh, user-owned devices, sorry, not just getting confused with another phrase, and there will be a definition of what is organisational data and organisational service, services. This is uh, will help clarify what's in scope and what type, what is a class of service for CE, etc. There's going to be some clarification on the requirements of software firewall usage. It's uh, been a little woolly, in there and open to some misinterpretation. So there's going to be a clarification around that. Um, and there's also going to be a clarification about um, third party support, IT support developers accounts on a client's uh, network. And when they're trying to gain CE certification there's a bit of bit of uh, wooliness around that and hopefully we're going to provide that clarification within the document okay right uh, the major change that's going to come up in those uh, the requirement document is around what was called patching requirements uh, the NCSC have requested that that's changed to security update requirements um, but one of the major changes there is 
is in bold is the third uh, bullet point down to have automatic updates enabled where possible. This is very much in line uh, in the thinking of the NCSC and speaking to their technical experts who have been speaking to some of the major vendors that the NCSC would like to see rather than they would see that they would like to see the automatic updates are enabled wherever possible. Um, it's not going to be, this is a difficult one at the moment because we're still thinking of how this exactly will be applied, but it very much has come back from feedback to do with Microsoft and Apple and Google, who the NCSE talked to, and they're very much seeing that automatic updates is the way forward to keep your system secure. There's also another change about deploying the day updates and how to choose them within 14 days here. One of the big changes that I mentioned a couple of times is that vendors have changed the way and the time patching requirements. They, they release patches. Now, one of the things that some of the vendors, and especially we've seen this with Apple and Google, is they've released details about patches but they're not releasing any information about the severity of the patches. Now, the actual requirement says you must apply high and critical updates within 14 days. Now, it's getting very difficult to judge whether these pack, packs of updates coming from these vendors contains high or critical updates because they're just not publishing the information anymore. So if there's no information published, on the severity, the requirement will be you need to, you need to apply that patch or update that update pack. You can see this with the Apple updates if you look at it, and if you have any knowledge about CVE numbers and the CVS scoring, CVSS scoring, you'll see that there's no published details of these updates anymore, and it's very much in the hands of the vendors why they're not publishing that and. We can confirm that those packs do contain high and critical. We have had ourselves conversations with Apple and the NCSC, but um, the only way to truly make sure your machines will be secure if there's no severity published is to apply the updates. Okay. Right. So, as I've mentioned, uh, just to recap with this evolutions project going on at the moment and what that means is it isn't going to stop in april and it won't stop as i've mentioned there in q4 this year cyber essentials is going to remain under constant evaluation and i would uh, there will be published changes on an annual basis to the scheme to keep it fresh in the way that the uh, it uh, vendor market is changing they're reacting to changing circumstances so it's very likely there will be changes and additions to cyber essentials on an annual basis okay so expect a major update to come later this year in q4 2012 where again all documentation will be updated and made publicly available and we hope to have that in well in advance of the go live date OK, and we're working with the NCSE to finalise that timeline at the moment. So regarding the coming changes, there will be a new question set. It's not going to be a major thing. It's just about some clarifications in there and hopefully to make applying for Cyber Essentials a bit clearer. We're going to try and break down some of the questions a bit more and be a bit more pointed at what it's asking for to take some ambiguity out of the questions as well. OK, and there will be a new CE infrastructure requirements document released. OK, I think that's uh, enough for now. Uh, hear me. I think we'd like to get the panel's views and uh, answer some of your questions. OK. Hi, thanks, Neil. Um, a couple of questions came in there just now. I would just take them first, I think. Uh, First one from David, am I right in thinking that modern EDR tools would be considered compliant with regard to the malware protection? For example, it's not something that runs updates on a regular basis, uses <laughs> signatures. Okay, I knew this was gonna come up. Right, uh, 
we're having to do this on a case by case basis at the moment. There's a lot of pressure going on to the NCSC about certain tools regarding this because there is a change to things called behavioral scanning or AI scanning. And then we're finding out they're not updating as regular as traditional anti malware tools. Um, one of the area, reasons why I can't give a definitive answer about this at the moment is because the NCSC are currently doing some research into these products at the moment, and we have to wait for that research to be completed. And I'm not expecting a quick answer on it, to be honest. Uh, I'm sorry to be woolly on that, but I can't give you a... It's one of those things, if you come to certification and using one of those, please contact IASME and uh, we'll help you out. Okay, Neil, thanks. And the second question from John. I assume firewall VLAN segregation is not the only option for legacy devices. How about network segmentation? Uh, that's what I think I, I said. We called it network net, segregating your networks anyway. Okay, they can't be on the uh, legacy applications or operating systems, can't be on the same network segment as the segment you're trying to get certified so we look for a firewall to be used or a, v, a separate vlan to take them out of that network Excellent. and again that's something you can talk to i ask me or the cbs about and they will help you with that okay there's a couple other questions come in of us Conscious you're getting hit with all the, the questions here, Neil. <laughs> I'm sure Kerry can help. He knows enough about it as well. <laughs> well, the next question is, can you confirm if the validity of the CSC is changing from the annual review to the continued compliance? For example, previous years may have been just a snapshot of requirements at the time of renewal. Uh yeah it, it, it currently it's staying as the snapshot but they are looking into evolving the scheme at a later date to possibly containing having a continual assessment product there is an ongoing project on about that at the moment and the last question in there from chris is we have had major problems with getting additional ce certificates i.e a company has two trading companies why is this taking so long to sort out we are working with carry on this uh, uh, that's not what I can answer. Um, I, I am aware of the issue. Um, it's, yeah. it's something that's being held, being discussed between our CEO and NCSE because it's not as straightforward as it perhaps it used to be. They're trying to be quite clear and defined. We get a lot. It's not only with Carey and ID Cyber, we get hundreds of requests for this and one of the one of the issues we have is we're trying to avoid this situation being gamed slightly so we've got to have some clear guidance around it and i know a process is going in place about that at the moment okay and david's just came back with a, a supplementary we're in the process of aiming for certification with an edr tool we're also in the process of acquisitions at the moment. Would these companies automatically be considered compliant when they're under our banner, as it were? Or should you wait for the deal to complete, then perform the C and C plus? Well, that, those companies would be additions to the scope, and that would be sufficient. That would be sufficient to say that that would be a major change to the scope. They couldn't be just accepted automatically. So yes, you. To include those additional companies, you would you'd have to recertify. Excellent, thank you. Okay, moving on then. Um, I think just following on from that, we'll maybe bring in Carrie from a, a practitioner's point of view. Given we've had the technical point of thing. Is there any comments or anything you want to bring up, Carrie? From yeah, so so specifically looking at the EDR um, situation as well. So. Um, there's, although there's a lot of products out there at the moment that, that go through this uh, endpoint protection and so on, um, 
there is still an element or a very large element for an, an AV type protection um, system to be accepted, but it has to pass the AMSO um, compliance test. And the AMSO compliance is, is the uh, malware testing standards organization. So, so, the, so the clue is in the name. So if it doesn't detect malware at the point that it sees them, for example, um, when you download something, when you save something to your desk, um, if it doesn't detect the malware at that point, um, technically your system didn't work. It didn't detect the malware from coming in. If the endpoint system is only there to detect it when it executes, that bit of malware can stay on a system for weeks, months, and so on. So, so, so for example, if you're doing a daily or weekly backups, for example, that piece of malware may be backed up um, for several weeks before it activates. So, so if you were to then to say, right, I'm going to restore from a backup, a clean backup, because we got infected by something, um, then you've just reintroduced this particular thing in your um, particular environment. Now, um, and this is just part of the problem. Um, things are moving on. Uh, we're moving a lot away from the sort of the traditional way of looking at AV and so on. But still, the most common attacks that occur is I'm clicking on something, I'm downloading something, I'm being emailed something, um, something comes as part of a program I'm down, downloading is being piggybacked on it and so on. So, and these are the kind of things that we're trying to advise folks to try and stop. Now, we're not um, trying to advise that you should go for totally AI kind of stuff. It's like, these are the basic things that we need to try and protect ourselves from the things that happen every single day. So, so if, if, if we are going to go for a loose, well, if we are trying to look at a solution that does um, endpoint protection and so on, it's a case of, right, if somebody sends me something, am I going to get alerted? Is there something that tells this thing, um, uh, at the regular interval, daily, weekly, twice monthly, or whatever the case may be, to say, hey, here is a list of things you need to look out for, and we'll detect all these kind of things. So I hope I hope that answer answers you know answers the thing about the EDR stuff. Um, on the um, net, the network segmentation part. Um, I think the if 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 we were to take our um, view on particular workstations, for example, imagine that this is day one of your employment at company X, right? So it's a case of how is my my system prepared? Um, does my system have the latest antivirus on? Is it a supported operating system? Does my username and password, does it have um, just the permissions that I require? The software that's installed in my system, is it just the software I need? Also, there are loads of trial versions of stuff installed on, you know, on my system. So, and it's all about just protecting me as a user um, on my very first day. So if, if on the network segmentation part, so if my machine was to get compromised and there are some legacy servers and stuff on the network that are probably out of support, but we need them for something. And there's loads and loads and loads of different um, types of options where they, that organizations have these legacy systems. Okay, so um, if, if my machine is the source of an outbreak, Am I going to affect those systems as well? If there is some barrier between me and them, you know that that will try and help um, sort of stem the breakout. If you know, if if, there, if this is a, I'm not going to say a nation state target, but if you are being targeted uh, against stuff, it will try and make the reconnaissance of your network, your internal structure, it will make it very very difficult. Um, to do it instantly, 
So, so, so attackers would need to be there for a long time to be able to see exactly what is on the network. And that activity that they will conduct to see where are your servers, you should be able to pick that up in the log files from the scanning and probing and everything else. So. Excellent, thanks, Carrie. Uh, one thing I just wanted to pick up on, and I'll bring Keith McDevitt in just, just shortly, is that a lot of, a lot of people, will, especially small businesses, will see um, IT as being the responsibility of maybe their IT managed service provider or whatever, and it's not really a matter for them. And and how do they, you know, they've outsourced the IT, but they don't outsource the risks sort of thing. So how, how do we sort of capture that? And how do we try and develop the... A, a sort of standard roundabout um, IT provider. So Keith, I don't know from the Scottish government's point of view if you want to come in and, and just talk about that for a little while. Yeah, th thanks, Graham. So the the Scotland as a nation, like, like every other nation's uh, dig digital first in its application, we're going to thrive uh, and grow um, uh, on online and, and with the evolving uh, digital um, infrastructure and of course we're, we're about to launch a new digital strategy and a new AI strategy so all of this uh, places us firmly online and connected in a way that we've never been in the past and increasingly so. So it's really important that we uh, baseline and all that is that we minimise the risks um, 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 to organizations and individuals and let's face it criminals as, as we know just to exploit opportunities and of course they're exploiting the opportunities that the digital age gives them in a way that, that, that you know they can't be as effective in the real world it's, it's just you can you know commit crime for your underpants in your house anywhere in the world and scotland particularly though is a nation of small and medium-sized businesses and they don't have the, the wherewithal often uh, to, to have the levels of support and technical knowledge that larger uh, organisations have. So it's really important for us that they are uh, protected as best they can be from these internet-borne threats. Uh, and that's why uh, the Scottish Government's got behind and funded over the last few years some initiatives to push cyber essentials as that baseline standard, the very thing that you can do to demonstrate to yourself and to your customers that you know, you're taking the appropriate steps to ensure that you're around, quite frankly, uh, to, to, to perform, perform your business. Um, and that, that's great because then you can do the growing and thriving on the top of that when you deal with uh, the vast majority of the untargeted attacks as they are. Because quite frankly, just by being online, you are at risk. Uh, and the point you made, Graham, is, is really, really important there. So there is this piece about um, uh, owning the risk and, and you, know, uh, it's, you know, not giving that risk uh, to some, someone else and just expecting them um, to, to uh, own that for you. And I think for very small businesses, uh, it's really common that in actual fact, they have a somebody who does their IT that's not in their organization. And uh, you would, and they are completely reliant because they're the techies, you know, the, the, the individual, and just to make sure that the business works online to allow you to, to do your business. And they're completely reliant on them uh, to ensure that the service remains up and also assume that they will take care of all and all, all the internet threats that are out there, and it was an interesting position with this the smaller your your organisation that probably the smaller because the cheaper uh, that uh, IT managed service provider uh, probably is, and I think what going forward we we need to have confidence in is one the small business being able to ask a handful of questions of their managed service provider that gives them confidence that in actual fact they are taking care of the cyber risks, not just the IT risks uh, and the IT support. But also, I think there's a, a piece of work to be done in helping the smaller, um, and of course, we've got Harry here from one of the, the large managed service providers, but actually the small and much smaller organizations who are out there supporting a huge and doing a cracking job supporting, um, you know, the provision of digital, uh, the digital economy that we're growing for the smaller businesses, but actually to help them demonstrate that they're match fit in their own right and to be clear on whether they're actually taking care of the cyber threats for, for, for SMEs. 
Uh, and to that end, Cyber Essentials um, does that to to a great degree for 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 both. Um, uh, and we will be looking at as we go forward how we can work with the smaller um, um, or the, the SMEs in their own right uh, within the managed IT services uh, to look at how they can be clear on whether they are actually providing that kind of service to uh, to the, their clients, and indeed. Uh, how they can demonstrate that they're actually match fit to do that. So Cyber Essentials for us, designed to be, um, and hopefully it will grow, um, uh, as Neil has said, over time and, and be all things to all people, but it's the baseline uh, capability that's proven to defend against the most common internet enabled attacks. And that's what we need businesses to do. The more targeted stuff, well, that's harder. We can just put that aside. If we can you know, do the 80-20 principle, look after ourselves by getting the basics right, that's a really good start of our 10. It's good for business to know that they can have some confidence uh, and their their own network is, is, is reasonably secure. And it's good for customers to know that the people they're dealing with are obviously secure and for larger businesses well let's face it you know cybercrime they're like the vampires they come chap your door and you have to let them in and that's either by phishing or by failing to uh, you know, update uh, some security vulnerabilities or quite frankly it's your supply chain and SMEs really form a significant part of that supply chain. So we now also have to uh, expect our suppliers uh, to be um, reasonably au fait with some of the risks, just as they are with other risks that are business risks like fire and flooding and major outages. The cyber risk is just here with us to stay. And this is one of the elements in which we can now demonstrate that the baselines are taken care of. Uh, and that's what we'll continue to do. So we're really continuing to promote the value of this baseline assessment. It isn't the catch all. It doesn't guarantee you're not going to get hit but it does keep away, just as firewalls do, the vast majority of the stuff that really shouldn't be interfering with you and giving you a bad day. Thanks, Keith. Harry, obviously this falls into a sort of bit of your, your area of business. Is there anything you want to, to bring up in, round, round about that? Um, not specifically. I think Cyber Essentials is a is a brilliant starting point for small and large businesses alike, just to make sure that they have the you know the basics covered. Um, I think what's one sometimes overlooked component, and this applies to any organisation, and that is um, basic IT hygiene. If that is your foundation, everything flows from it. And if you have if you lock that down well. And that goes for corporates with 200,000 endpoints. It goes for a small business with five computers and a printer. You actually are already in a much stronger position just to know what you've got. If you look at the um, Computer Internet Security Forum, the CIS Common Security Controls, the first two are know what your assets are and know what's on your assets. And if you can underpin that with a knowledge of not only what they are, but what they're used for, I would, I would argue you're almost 50% of the way there to securing them because, you know, ask any organization for an asset list and you're going to often receive a couple of Excels, an email and a link to a wiki that was updated two years ago. Um, and, and that's simply not good enough if you're wanting to protect those assets. You know, think about, about it from an insurance perspective. If you're going to go to your insurer and insure your business assets, whether you're in a factory, a warehouse or anywhere else, they're going to ask you for an asset list. They're going to want to know, well, what are we actually protecting? What are we insuring you against? And it's the same in cybersecurity. If you can't tell me what that computer, what that server is used for, then I can't appropriately tell you how you should be protecting it. And so I would definitely encourage everyone, whether you're preparing for, you know, the um, going through your initial assessment or you're trying to mature from that point view onwards, start with an understanding of your assets, what they're used for, and then your identities, who uses them and for what purpose. Um, the second point I wanted to pick up on, which was around EDR, and I, I 
I'm going to disclose this is not from a cyber essentials point of view because that's not my area of specialty. I don't know how it should or should not impact cyber essential certification. But I would say from what I'm seeing in the field is that EDR technologies as a as a protection mechanism is showing uh, a lot of real value in the customers I work with. Um, fileless malware, so malware that doesn't generate files on the on the disk drive or on the drive in the block-based storage is massively on the rise. Rise Cisco rated it as the number one risk um, in malware last year, um, followed up by McAfee and CrowdStrike saying essentially the same. When it comes to you know large scale or even highly impactful destruction, it is often through living off the land. It, it is, you know. It, I would not say gone are the days where signature-based detections work, but I would say that they are not enough malware. And there's so many families of malware now where it's, you know, essentially it's just been purchased. You know, people are buying entire malware creation platforms from the, the very clever organized crime or, or nation state actors. They're now just leasing them and packaging these very, very advanced capabilities that if you're only looking for signatures of something that's been written to your disk, it's just not going to pick it up. Um, it's going to execute in memory. It's going to leverage PowerShell or other system tools to, to work. And it's going to be obfuscated to the point that your you know, basic detections are simply not adequate. And so tools that do use behavioral detections, whether or not it's got anything to do with AI is a, a debate for another time. But you know, just simply looking for common behaviors that result in bad outcomes like Outlook calling PowerShell, for example, that should never happen. Or a PDF calling a PS internals tool, that should never happen. And they're the kind of things that behavioral detections and protected technologies can provide. Thanks, Harry. That's really useful. There's another question came in, guys, um, from Ian. Uh, and it's talking about clients who have refused to renew Cyber Essentials. And the main reason is that they're not keen on the idea of having an additional cost for monitoring staff personal devices. Uh, is there a boundary to where the CSE requirements need to be met in regards to this? Let's go back to the sort of home working perspective. Neil, would you like to pick up on that one? Yeah, I'll try to. <laughs> um, I think the best way to look at this is, yes, uh, there's two two aspects to this. Um, previously, before April 2020, uh, perhaps homeworking from different accreditation bodies wasn't taken the same uh, as it is seen by the NCSC, which is the reason for making sure there was a sole partner and making sure this certain issues were tackled in a consistent manner with the scheme. Uh, we've been made aware of this, and I think some people who've been asked to reapply for Cyber Essentials perhaps would get got it from a different accreditation body and their interpretation was completely different. So they're struggling with the fact that the, the rules around this has changed or something like that. But the other aspect that's a bit of an issue here is it's been caused by the pandemic. Uh, no doubt about that, because the world's greatly shifted from being in the office to working at home. <laughs> and that has presented us in the tech working group uh, with massive challenges. We were hoping to have some updates around this, but I can assure you, if you're having issues with clients about uh, home working requirements, et cetera, please come and have a conversation with IASME. Uh, we are working in a tech working group directly with the NCSC. We have fed, given them loads of feedback about home working requirements. Uh, we are working on this, but there are several factors involved. Um, but we will have a clearer position later in the year for this. Um, but at the moment, it's quite fluid because of the developments that's gone on due to the pandemic. And as you can appreciate, not every home working scenario is exactly the same. And as we find with the whole of Cyber Essentials, um, many people think there's five or six different scenarios that covers the whole Cyber Essentials. I can say that's many thousand. Uh, if you, my team alone, see probably a new scoping Absolute, so scoping scenario never dreamt of every day 
and home working is a big part of that and we know that monitoring of home workers systems and BYOD etc is timely and can be costly to the applicant companies but there we're looking at ways of addressing that at the moment but one thing I can say is and be confirmed on is that the BYOD element of Cyber Essentials will remain and some form of controls will need to remain in place. Now, can I come in there? Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, so, so I, I guess before we get lost in the, you know, challenges of, of that sort of home working and aspects of routers, I guess it's really about the risk um, and, and we should fundamentally wind back and understand what additional risk um, is placed on the organisation when you know, in this working from home environment, mm -hmm. and you know if, if that's essentially the, the key issue that um, the cyber essentials is trying to address. So we're really trying to deal with the critical controls that minimise the most common risks. Um, so so we could definitely get lost in a conversation um, about the technical aspect about that. But I think if it was clearer or just more clearly stated that this is an area that does present risk and there was evidence for that, maybe there'd be less uh, probably pushback on the challenges that it perhaps uh, presents. Because quite frankly, um, almost every organisation managed to get online and, and with a home working environment, which is amazing that we've managed to do that, but it isn't without risk. Uh, and I just think sometimes we, we need to be clear on, you know, whilst there may be some technical challenges here, it is about addressing a risk. And I think if that was made clearer, maybe people would, would be less um, challenging uh, in, in relation to that, because yes, there are technical problems associated with all, the, all of that and guidance will come, but actually we just need to be clear, is it or is it not a, a, a greater risk? Um, the, I totally echo what you're saying there, and that is something that we, we've addressed regarding the scheme and the communications about the scheme, that some areas need more public information out there and explain why they, these controls are in place. Uh, I certainly know that's being worked on at the moment. And one of the issues is the NCSC currently are updating all their end user device guidance. And part of that is um, that that's due to be released very soon. They're trying to do that on an annual basis now. And that's one of the issues here, but they're trying to update it for the current situation and explain some of the issues. Also, there's a couple of other initiatives going on around this. So the NCSC have their own cyber aware initiative, uh, which gives guidance on certain aspects. And also there is a new CE readiness tool, which will be launched towards the end of March, which will provide some of this guidance and explain why some of these what some of this stuff is required because CE hasn't had that and it's again it comes back to having the partnership and working together and then being able to work on joint guidance because previously perhaps there was different in the different interpretations and the guidance would have been different now it's going to be a joined up process between the NCSE and IASME and we were I can assure you we are working a lot in the background to get quality guidance out there and also to try and get some clarifications from the NCSC published out there as well. So we're certainly working on that now. Okay. Thanks, Neil. Um, just conscious of time, folks. That's yeah. an hour a bit in now. So I think on that note, uh, what my observation is that you know having a single partner can only be a good thing in terms of reducing that sort of um, myriad of different interpretations of the scheme and trying to have that consistency of approach moving forward. So I think that's to be be commended. Um, I just want to finish off by saying to everyone, thanks very much for your time on the panel today. Guys, I really appreciate it. We're all, all really busy. And, and thanks to everyone uh, who has joined us and, and, and contributed to the questions. I really appreciate that as well. Uh, this will be available online. Uh, the recording will be made available online afterwards if anybody else wants to, to pick up on that. But in the meantime, can I just thank you all and wish you all the very best. And we'll speak to you later.
Thanks for having me. Thanks all. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Yep. Bye. Thank you.